Um, okay. So you were born on the ranch? No, I was born in St. Mary's Hospital okay. on Royal Avenue that no longer exists, is, is gone. Um, 1944. July the 7th. Um, 11.08 oh, 11 in the morning, apparently. Yes. Um, what did your parents do? My father was a mill worker at McMullen Bodell on Marine Drive and drove the overhead crane that loaded uh, the barges with lumber. Um, so, did he work on the ranch at all? He, or how's your connection? He was a caretaker of the ranch. Oh, okay. Uh, my mother and my father and the four of us children at that time, uh, they were caretakers. They looked after the ranch uh, for the owner. Never knew who the owner was, but he had lots of money because he had racehorses. So at that time, uh, uh, in those times, that there was money that he had bought the property and that's what he used it for so my parents were caretakers and if you look at the way it's laid out mm -hmm. we had uh, the ranch house was unique it had a wraparound three-quarter wraparound porch and it was absolutely stunning the I would say south side looked upon down the slope of the orchard on the pasture through the orchard into the river. Um, the west side of the of the veranda, as we called them in those days, it uh, looked out into the the bush and the uh, trees that were around. Um, if you can see, there was a huge garden. There was a chicken coop. Uh, there was pens for pigs and cows. And uh, he was the caretaker of all that area. So he looked after, my mom and him looked after all that particular area. So they were caretakers. Mm -hmm. um, so was the fruit, like was it sold or like? No. Did it function as a business or? Basically no, the, the, the food that was grew was for our own use. The apple orchards and cherries was basically for the use of the family. It wasn't, um, I think the apple orchard and the cherry trees weren't large enough to make it into a commercial idea. So it was basically uh, food for the, uh, the family that was on the ranch. Okay. And the, the owner never really came? If the owner did in, in, in from 44 to, to 52 that I was there and our, my brothers and sisters were there, he may have came, but we we never, we could have met the man, but uh, to tell you the truth, I don't, uh, I, I would not remember. That's one of the re memory, no, I wouldn't remember if he came or not. So usually in those days, if somebody important was coming to the ranch, we were in our best bib and tucker, as we used to say, to use a term, old term. We used to be, so we knew something was happening when we were all in our, Sunday clothes. Yes. Stiffy up. Stiffy up. Yes, indeed. Other than that, no, I would not have uh, remembered at all. But it, it was a large, um, as you can see the way it's laid out, it was a large um, place. Uh, the pastures and the orchard. Now, across on the other side, I where I put the fencing on the other side on to the east that was mr young's property and mr young was a farmer and that's where we first got to know what Clydesdales were because he had two of them i think he called one mike and one mo mike and mo the Clydesdales. they were beautiful horses just first time like in your child and something that large they were stunning horses and he had two Clydesdales. And he basically farmed. So what he grew, he sold. 
it, for Mr. Young, it was a commercial entity. It was uh, a great man, a lot of fun, uh, was always um, willing to show, teach. So we had a wonderful childhood there. We, we really, truly grew up in, a, in an area that would be, I'd say for children, would be magical. And it was, we had chores. I mean, um, when they had cattle and they were slaughtering cattle, we got, I think it was 50 cents a bucket to carry the guts to the, what they call the gut pit. And we would dump our buckets and we'd go back and a little, little eh, but we got 50 cents a bucket. So we, that was pretty good money in those days. You do a lot with 50 cents in those days. Lots. Yes, it was fun. Great fun. And of course we were in the, I, I, I'm, and say I'm one of the few, well, I imagine there are other, other residents in, in New Westminster, but every afternoon, if you can see at the bottom there where it says the, the uh, train tracks, there was a stoop, and that, that little box you see there, that's called the stoop, where you cross over a fence. You, it's like walking up one ladder and then going down another ladder, and they call them stoops. And we would sit there and wave at the steam train going by. And... Uh, it was magical. I mean, these were big, huge steam engines. They were amazing. Uh, and he'd give us the the whistle when he or the toot when he went by, and yeah, great fun. Yeah. Now that that um, particular area, um, like I say, it was a long driveway down into the ranch house. Huge maples. Not maples you see around here today. We're, I'm talking maples that were 50, 60 feet high. Big, huge trees. And they lined the driveway going down on one side um, and around the house were these huge, which we climbed on. That was our activities and, and the fun we had. We had rope swings, uh, fortresses. Yeah, we, uh, we, like I say, as children growing up, we had a really fun time. Um, we used to go and harass the animals in the, in the animal pens. And my father one day said to us, don't bother the pigs. And we said, well, why not? He said, because I will show you. And he took a broom handle and he put it in the pig pen and the sow snapped the broom handle. And he said, now think of that as your leg or your arm. <laughs> and we kind of went. We don't fool around with the pigs. But what we used to do as we were nasty little children that we were, my cousins and I and my brother, we would wait till the cows were asleep in the field, chewing their cud. We'd sneak up behind them and jump on their back, <laughs> go for rides. But like I say, the, the house itself was, was huge. Um, I think it had... Uh, Five bedrooms, a uh, huge kitchen, big front room, and, and, and it's, I have to say that it's, no pictures exist of this, which I'm really, I'm trying to find out from my brothers if any pictures do exist in any of our family albums, because that's when I talked to Barry, I was so surprised that there's no pictures of this. He has no record that this existed. And I was genuinely surprised because it was a beautiful place. You, you've got a picture of this long driveway down to this absolutely magnificent ranch house. Just gorgeous. It, uh, and no pictures exist. And that little building across from the, there, the little square by the, when you come down the driveway where it says ranch house, that was the woodshed, yeah, that was the woodshed and workshop. And it had all the, all the tools you could possibly want if you were a blacksmith. It had the wheels, it had the grinding wheels, it had the forge, because the ranch itself was self-sustaining. In other words, if something broke, in those days you didn't go out to Home Depot and buy a new part. You literally manufactured your own parts. They had their own wheels, wagons. All, all the material that you would need 
to uh, run the ranch. So did your dad know how to blacksmith? Yes. He did, did. Where did he learn? I really don't, I don't know, because when you're a child, you, you just, you're there watching him do it. You, you don't realize where he had the opportunity to learn it, but, uh, uh, yeah, he, he had those skills and those tools, and, uh, uh, so, again, we would, uh, take great delight in watching some of the things that they made and they built. Uh, it was, uh, like I say, great fun. Is there anything else you'd like to know that is specific? Specific? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what about the swimming pool? Well, oh, that was interesting. That's an art, where you'll see there, there's two circles. Mm -hmm. That was an artesian well in a little ravine. And the Argent, the water was amazing. Uh, so fresh, so vibrantly tasting water. It came out of the artesian well, flowed down the creek bed, and at the end, just before it went into the river, and just before the railway tracks and the fence, they built a, a log pool. So we as children would go down with parents. We would go down and swim in the pool. It wasn't a beaver dam. It was an actually constructed breakwater so the water built up to a certain level and flowed over the logs and uh, that's where we swam in the summertime yeah it was uh, or played or um, and that's why again it was noted, noted as spring ranch because it had it on its own artesian spring on the property oh that must be fun <laughs> oh, it was it I look at her, I, you sit back after 70 years, and I'm 70 in July, and you look back at the childhood you had, and I, I do make, you, uh, inevitably you make a comparison. And I look at what children have today, and my two grandsons, and I look at what they do, and they're having fun, and they're having that childhood process of doing wonderful things, we did things that were just amazing. I mean, to have the property like that, and not sitting on computers, and not sitting on, but just great, great fun. It was a totally different era, gone now, sadly because of the Queensboro Bridge, but that's pretty much, uh, it was a unique gift to grow up in that particular piece of property. And that's why it surprises me that um, there's no record of it. I just find that, wow, that's pretty amazing. What did you mean by the Queensboro Bridge? Well, the Queensboro Bridge that exists right now. Oh. Uh, you've never been over the Queensboro Bridge? No, I meant, sorry, I meant, um, what did you mean that well, the they, era when they, ended? When they built, built the Queensboro Bridge, all that disappeared. Because the bridgeway, the paths and the ways of the Queensboro Bridge, all Mr. Young's property, uh, Spring Ranch disappeared to construct the bridge because the bridge literally, uh, the bridge okay. literally is built right over that property. So if you, if you go over the Queensboro Bridge and you make the first bend and look, if you were looking down, you would be looking down at Spring Ranch. If you looked on the other side, on if you went Walked on the right side, going over the bridge, you're looking down at Spring Ranch. If you walked over the left side, coming back, you're looking at Mr. Young's property. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I, I didn't realize the bridge had actually gone right on top of yeah. it. Yeah. Basically, those two properties disappeared when they built the Queensboro Bridge. Yeah. Um, that was a very notorious piece of uh, Marine Drive. Uh, as it went past the property of Spring Ranch, it took a sharp bend. They called it suicide bend. Just as you go past the property, and just before you got to Trap Road, where it goes down, Trap Road still exists today, but just before it got to Trap Road, they would have an accident a week on that corner. Literally an accident a week. And people being killed because of this 
driving too fast, making, and it was a very sharp turn as it went past our property, the ranch, and we'd, we'd, we'd go up there and you, you'd know that if something was wrong. And the other piece of very interesting history about those train tracks and that ranch is a person in New Westminster, I think his first name was Toby, lost his leg on those tracks run over by a steam engine and they brought him up to the ranch house. They had him in the kitchen all wrapped up but lost his leg and the doctor told my mother that she gave him the best thing that he could have been given at the time and she made him what they call sweetened tea, lots of sugar in it and he said that stabilized him. And he still He's not alive, I don't think he's alive today in New Westminster, but for many, many years after um, that accident, um, he was in the city of New Westminster. Now, I don't know if they've got any, and it was a horrific accident. I mean, it cut his leg off, he got cut off of it here. Yeah. We saw the gruesome end of it because the police officer picked up the boot and then the boot was Toby's leg. And they wrapped it up. And we were all wet. Just as kids are, children, they, uh, that to them was fascinating. But that's another piece of the history of that, that particular set of tracks in front of the property. Yeah. But I don't know if you might find stories about Toby losing his leg. You, there is possible stories of that particular accident. Were there any other, what was kind of around the two farms, or the farm? Above New, above Marine Drive on the north side, above, was residential housing okay. and a general store. Um, down, if you go around the corner, left, and down from coming, as you can see the word bush, mm -hmm. that was all bush as you went past the farm, or past the ranch, and down the hill, was pretty much all bush. If you go there today, you will see that it's a train yard, but in those days it was all bush. Very raw, rare and raw uh, material. So there was a, I think there was one, two, three, four, five houses on the north side of Marine Drive and a general store. And that's what existed there. Um, Pretty much, pretty much between DL, district something it means, district longitude or district latitude, it had a specific name. You could probably look that up in, in the land registry, what the definition of DL was. Because I remember it distinctly that it was DL. And around that, at the time, in 1944, 1952, was pretty much Bush. Down Trap Road, there was farms. A lot of farms down Trap Road. Uh, more than there ever is today. I mean, so much is gone from uh, that era. It's just gone. It, 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 you were pretty much farmland from as you went down Trap Road. We used to go down Trap Road into the, into the um, ditches and we would catch eels. And we'd sell the eels to the fishermen. So there was always a purpose of what, you know, because uh, in those, in, in, in along those ditches in those days were eels, what they call bloodsuckers. And we'd capture them and sell them to fishermen for using as bait on their, because again, sit, you know, right on the Fraser River, a lot of people fished and, yeah. We used to go down and catch hooligans. Uh, we don't, can't do that anymore. But we used to go down and catch hooligans by the bucketfuls. Because they'd come into the river, spawning, and we'd go down. And you could literally throw your bucket out in the river when they were spawning and bring in buckets of hooligans. What happened to them? It, it, use of people, uh, like, overfished, basically. Yeah, overfish. Climate change is overfishing. Uh, disappeared. But we, 
Pulligan feast was that was those were special days. They were my father would would um, bake them up, and you didn't clean them. You just baked them up, and uh, you put them in a deep fryer. Roll them a little bit of flour, put them in the deep fryer. Fabulous, fabulous. Yes, a lot of things have gone by the wayside. Um, progress is progress. It's it's what uh, happens. I mean. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in, I enjoy this because to me this is a huge memory. This is um, this is a part of my history growing up in the city of New Westminster. Um, Diane, my wife's family. Diane, Hello. how many generations are, are you in the New West? Well, I, I, the boys, the, the, the grandsons are five. Five generations. Five generations growing up in this city. Now, this didn't exist well, I'm, here. I'm four. Diane's four. Four. She's four. Corinne will be, her children will be, are, are five. Her grandsons are six. Six generations in this born here. Yes. That's incredible. That's incredible. And this this used to be farmland where you're sitting now. How do you, like, one of the things we're interested in is how you've seen the waterfront particularly change. Well, it's interesting. The waterfront in New Westminster, you could walk along the waterfront in 1952. You, you knew the trains were coming, so you were always aware of the fact that you did have trains. But you knew they came at specific times during the day. But you could walk from that ranch. We would walk into New Westminster from the ranch along the train tracks because it was safe. Um, occasionally, you would see um, deer. Didn't see too many bears, but they were around because in those days it was all bush. It was not, um, uh, but walking along the waterfront up and oh, I can and I can only sort of block my mind into 50, 1952. You could literally, you were in very, very little business around the uh, along the river. Uh, you could go over to Popular Island. We used to play in the sand dunes down at the bottom of, um, okay, I'm going to give you an idea where this is. If you go in down to the quay and you go west from the quay, and when you get to the end of where the quay is, think of where the, the, the old Queensborough Bridge is, the old wooden bridge. Well, Lafarge Cement had their sand stored there. And these were mountains, huge mountains of sand. We played on those mountains of sand. We played where Skytrain Maintenance Yard is. We played in what they called the Connaught Pit. We played, we weren't supposed to play there because it was, uh, parents considered it dangerous because it was a cliff. I mean, I think about I don't know. 50 to 100 feet. If you fell off the top, you probably hit the bottom at about 50 to 100 feet in certain parts of it. We played all over those things. We had um, the tram, when, which is now Skytrain, the old BC electric trams, we rode those things with wooden benches. And If you want to know about trams, they're preserving them over by the... Um, they're going to have to move soon because the property is going to be sold. But if you go to Braid Station and you look along the side of that building in Braid Station, they're refurbishing and rebuilding the old BC Electric trams down on Braid. I didn't know that. That's yes. so cool. Yeah. They're putting together a whole 
along that side of that building on those tracks that run along the side. When you're coming from Lougheed Mall on the on the SkyTrain, look at the side of that building. There'll be you'll see all these tarps. Well, underneath those tarps are some of the old BC electric trams being rebuilt, refurbished. We saw they had wooden benches. It was and they swayed. Man, you could get a really good sway going. And that tram, BC Electric, where you have the new Army, Salvation Army store, the thrift store, that was the tram station. Trams used to come into that, into that building, and you'd get off the tram and then go over and get your buses wherever you're going. Yeah. I don't know what else you would like to know, but that's pretty much the story of Spring Ranch. It sounds like beautiful. It was, like I say, it was an era that um, totally self-sustaining. Uh, if we were going down into Westminster to buy something, we, were, we went usually go down to Westminster to buy, we had a huge farmer's market uh, in New Westminster at the time. There's so many parts of Westminster. We used to have circuses come to New Westminster. Things that we, the Barney and uh, Barney and Bailey Circus used to come to New Westminster and to, uh, Moody Park. Huge tents, just just amazing fun. The but we that ranch itself completely self-sustained. It had it it had its own meats. It had. Um, like I say, it had its own slaughterhouse, so it literally encompassed a world that's onto its own. It was a pretty self-sustaining area uh, as a ranch. It, it was, uh, you, you literally didn't have to go out and get anything if you didn't uh, need. We had dairy cows, so they had, um, they had steers and beef, beef cattle, because you raise beef cattle. Uh, he put his he had his racing horses there for one summer, and he decided that it wasn't good for the horses because the steers and the race horses did not get along. They were constantly being harassed or harassing each other. Um, it was completely electrified on one side, so they couldn't get out because it was an electrified fence from Mr. Young's property down to this. Um, so that all of, along Mr. Young's and then down to this point here, this corner, if you come along here where the river is, that was all electrified fences, just, just to keep the cattle and the racehorses, because along this bush side, uh, too dense, they wouldn't go at that side. But like I say, it was a completely self-sustained unit. Yeah. So did you have friends in the area or do you mostly just with your brothers and oh sisters? no we we went to Tweedsmer okay Tweedsmer uh, elementary school uh, that was our um, we'd walk to school every when being of school age we'd walk to school and I think I was there for two to three years my brothers and sisters uh, they all went there yeah the four of us uh, Ended up with a family of nine, six, six boys and three girls. Wow. Yeah. Big Four family. girls. Big. Oh, hey. I don't know. It, uh, they were pretty tough young ladies. By the time they got to, to teenagehood, they could hold their own because they had, they had brothers that were, you know, if you had to want to, when we played games, it was you who put up with it or you didn't play, so. But that's, there was four of us when we lived at the ranch. Um, and then sub subsequently, mother and father added more children as they went along. Yeah. Do you remember any kind of community events or like fairs or? Well, we used to go up to Queens, uh, to Moody Park. When the circus came to town, um, there was, um, the community gathered. Uh, you have to get um, May Day. We went to May Day at Queen's Park um, as children. Mm -hmm. I did the Maypoles. Uh, 
learned about doing the maples. Um, the, of course, on Saturdays was a big day because you'd go into New Westminster to the farmer's market. And like I say, it was not like it is there today when they have it up above City Hall. This was a huge farmer's market. You could, pretty much everything that you wanted to buy, you could purchase at this farmer's market. But uh, like, like my parents, they didn't need vegetables or anything like that. So if we had something that we needed to choose, we'd go into the old Army and Navy store. Um, which is now being, that building is now being rebuilt and preserved, the old Army, Army and Navy store in New West Island, Columbia. But uh, community events, if there was something that was special going on in the city, yeah, we'd all walk to the city. Didn't take buses, we just walked, because it wasn't that far. I think it was probably a mile and a half walk by the time you got to downtown New West. Yeah. How would you compare the sense of community now in the U.S.? Well, I don't think you can compare. I think trying to compare a modern, urbanized mm -hmm. city of apartment blocks is difficult and shouldn't be done. And, I, and the reason that we had a community that if you moved throughout the neighborhood, every person knew who you were um, being as young children, you were watched, and I don't mean that in a derogatory or perverted way, but families watched families, and they knew what time you were coming home from school, they knew which way you walked. You were pretty much uh, within a community within a community. Um, today, uh, we never had things like neighborhood watch because you didn't need it. We never had this, the, some of the sadness that I think exists in communities today. We walked to school, and we'd walk up to Tweedsmere, and we would walk home with no fear. And you see the change in some of the communities where a lot of, I sit here at the house and I watch parents bring their children to school, Children bring their, our parents bring their children to the McBride more than we ever did in 1944, 1952. Uh, be, there was no sense of danger like you have today. And that's a change. Um, I think the thing that changed in the city of New Westminster was Clifford Robert Olson. He changed the attitude of parents taking their children to school because they were fearful of the fact he was out there, this person was out there, and you saw parents. And if you look at news events of today, something happens to a child and it's an immediate protection uh, philosophy. They, they, they literally swarm and protect. Um, that's the difference. Um, in, in 52, we never had to worry about walking home from school. Never. Because you were literally walking through people that knew you, people that loved you, and they just, they watched. If you wanted to, you were thirsty and wanted to drink of water, you'd go up to Mr. Young's house, knock on the door and say, you know, could I, and it was, it was there. I mean, that kind of protection, that kind of wanting to be part of the neighborhood was there. Always there. So yeah, it has changed. I think we live in a more fearful world today, sadly. I would agree. Um, young people uh, traveling, uh, we have modern conveniences, SkyTrain, marvelous, and people are very careful about riding. We are disconnected today. We were connected in 1952 to that community. We are disconnected today. And the thing that's disconnecting us today is modern technology. If you watch when you sit on SkyTrain, more people are plugged in to their isolation. And I use the term isolation because the moment you put those earphones in or you're sitting there on your iPhone, you are isolated. 
You are no longer aware of what's going on around you. You are isolating yourself from the community that is with you. I don't do that. I don't put it in letters. I don't sit and text or... We lost conversation today. I don't talk to you. I text you. That's very true. <laughs> Sad. I find it more in, enlightening and more enjoyable doing this than I'm going to text you, Courtney. Hope you're well. I'd rather see, okay, hear your voice. Your voice will tell me what you're thinking. Your face will tell me how you feel. Because I can look at it and see what it does. Today, we don't do that today. We text. My granddaughter texts me. I'd rather phone her up and talk to her. Then I can hear how she's doing. That's where we're today. And I'm not saying it's not beneficial, but in 1952, I had more fun as a child than children sometimes have today. Just because of nature. It's the change of the pace we live. Look at the pace we live today. This was a wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you went to school, fine, but this was a playground. This was something that is very rarely given. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no. Me, telling me I want to cruise. <laughs> My first word on those is delete. <laughs> yes. So anything else you'd like to know? Um, did you shop on Columbia Street? Oh, yeah. Is that the place to be? Yes. Oh, there was marvelous stores on Columbia Street. There was um, uh, Marshall Wells. And that was a hardware store of wonderful things as a child. I mean, this was magic world. You didn't. We came from an era where we were allowed to walk in the store, but if we touched anything, we were in trouble. The dis discipline was you may look, but you may not touch. And my parents were not strict disciplinarians, but their philosophy was, my father's philosophy and my mother's philosophy was, you're representing us. Behave as such. And that was the, the philosophy that was given. And so the four, the first four children were very courteous, well-mannered children. Because that's what my mother and father expected. Today, I don't think so much today. We've lost, we've lost the ability today to be courteous to each other. We've lost the ability to use good manners to our fellow humans. We are in a hurry. Uh, we have to get there. Um, it's a greater rush today than it was then. It wasn't such a panic to get somewhere. It wasn't such a panic. Oh, I've got exams. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. No, that didn't exist. It was more laid back very casual. You knew everybody. You knew all the people around you and they knew who you were. It, the sense of community was terrific. Not like today. Like I go to work in, in, in the morning. I work at the Cancer Research Center. I go to work by SkyTrain. I've never seen that type of rudeness personified as I do today. Rude. I my wife works at IKEA. People treat her in such a manner today, as she is a, a kitchen planner, with rudeness, and say things to her and treat her horrible. In my estimation, horrible. But that's today. That would never happen. 1952. You would never talk rude to a store, store clerk in 1952. You just would not do it. But that's what we've changed. And you don't teach good manners. See, we're taught manners and courtesy in school. We had classes in it. 
Really? Yes. Very much so. Lord Tweetsmer? Yes. We had, I guess you would call it today, if you're going to use the term, we had etiquette classes. Uh, Just how you treated people. What was expected of you? Um, to be Not to be rude. To be courteous. To treat your elders with respect. And we were literally, it was, it was hugely driven into your mindset that elderly people were to be treated with the most respect you could possibly. Today, I don't see it today. And I'm elderly. <laughs> and I just don't see it. Yeah. So we have changed. Different era. Different time. I'm... I'm saddened by the my, by the fact that my grandsons do more things on the computer than they do outside of that technological area. I, I'm they spend hours on the computer. I'm not into that. You carry around a cell phone. I do. Why do you carry a cell phone? So people can get hold of me. I carried around a cell phone for emergencies. It's, I now text. <laughs> Not very much, but I do text. Because if it's the only way I'm going to have communication with my granddaughter, yeah. then I'll text her. Yeah. I'll text her. And we, look, we changed language in the last 20 years. And people don't realize it. People don't talk, in, they don't have conversations like this anymore. This does not happen. The art of conversation has <laughs> gone down it's a lot. It's diminished. Yes. Because people don't have the time for it. This takes, you and I sitting here talking back and forth, takes time. Yes. Takes a commitment. People don't have the time anymore. Their perceived notion of their world today is I have to get it done. And it's true. There's a lot of pressures on young people's middle-aged, whatever, to get it done. <laughs> yes, there is. I, I wish they could that. sit in that ranch on those fields sometimes and not have to get it done. You so, have to train yourself now to have time not to get things yes. done. Like you're, you're in that age, and how old are you? I'm 21. 21, where in the next 10 years... So much is going to be in your world, it's hard to find that moment. It is difficult to do. Do I cherish your road? Yes. Your adventure? Yes. Because you're 21 and what's coming around you is phenomenal. It's fabulous what you're, gonna, you're actually going to grow through. When you get to my age, the part of the world that you're going to live through and see is going to be fantastic. Will it be better? I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. Find something to do other than what you do. In other words, life, having a family, find something that makes you feel adventurous and gives you joy. Find that as you go through your life. Because that's important. That's the dream. That's important. Always got to find that. I, I found those things in my life that uh, I had a unique father. He was, he was a grand, great mentor. He was a brilliant reader. He consumed books. Very learned man. He read everything. And I mean everything. You could sit him down and he can give you chapter and verse of the Holy Bible. He was that read. Uh, so when you have those kind of people in your lives, cherish them because they're really important. Yeah. Kind of, kind of got a little bit off that. Just a little bit. <laughs> kind of got off that. I, well, what I, other stores were on Columbia? You started to um, mention a few. There was Kresge's. Um, Kresge's. Oh, gosh. Kresge's. There were little stores. There was, Kresge's had a wooden floor which was really neat. You walked on a wooden floor. 
Uh, most of the stores, Army and Navy Eaton's, which is no longer in existence, period. Where the Army and Navy is on Columbia Street today, that used to be Eaton's, where the Army and Navy was. And Eaton was, Eaton's was high-end. There used to be a restaurant in New Westminster called King Nephews. Stunning restaurant. One of the best seafood restaurants that ever existed on the lower mainland. And it had to move after they, when they <coughs> started to develop the key. But Kresge's had a bar, a soda bar, where you could go in and you could order strawberry, lime, lime ricky, um, all these different ice creams and sauce, so and, and I guess they used to call them, we used to call them sauces. So you'd order a raspberry sauce float, big, huge float, three, or, three scoops of ice cream and this sauce. And I haven't had one for a long time. Uh. And the only, I can, in, 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 in fact, in the last, I imagine there are still establishments that sell them, but the only place that I've had one that brought back all that memory was in Rome. Rome? Yes. A re particular restaurant in Rome, down by the train station, gave you the classic float. But Kresge's had the pole. Oh, it was just a neat store. The hamburger. You'd sit at a, on a bar stool. Long counter. Curved counter. And you'd sit there and have your hamburger and fries and your floats. And these were really rare treats for us because money being money. And, and even in those days, uh, it, it, you still, you know, it was you had to buy things and pay for things. and So when we got our... Our quarter, you used to cherish that quarter because you could go up to the Metro Theater, which is now, what's the Metro Theater on 12th Street? It's turned to a hall, I think, now. But it used to be the Metro Theater and the, used, and the Odeon Theater, where there's now a spa up on 6th. And you'd go up there on a Saturday and see the matinee. It was a nickel to get in. So you take your quarter, you would give the quarter, and that got you into the theater. It got you into the theater for probably an hour and a half. And again, we'd go up by ourselves. We didn't have any parent escort. We would get our quarter, magic money. We'd go up, we'd save. So we had 20 cents left. Now, we could go down to my aunt's store, which was on the corner of 5th Avenue and 12th Street, and it was called Honors. That was the name of my aunt, my aunt Honor. And we'd go in there, and she'd give us a free ice cream cone. And we'd walk down 5th Avenue, down, right in to Spring Ridge. And that was the... So, you, if you had this... There's 20 cents left. You see, in those days, you could buy, for one penny, five jawbreakers for a penny. And they were really good jawbreakers. So you would literally save up two weeks of 20 cents. So you'd go into the store, because my aunt was generous, but she wasn't that generous. <laughs> you'd go into the store with your 40 cents now that you would save. And you would buy 40 cents worth of jawbreakers. Five for a penny. You got 200 jawbreakers. 200 jawbreakers with now money. For us kids, if you wanted something, you would barter and trade so many jawbreakers, like if you wanted a baseball card or somebody had a marble that you kind of really, really wanted to have that marble, you would go and say, how many jawbreakers do you want for that marble? Because that child that you were dealing with hadn't had any jawbreakers for a long time. So you had the jawbreakers. Because you'd saved up and done this. And that was our bartering system. That's how you got a toy car, or you got a baseball card. I could say, I probably, in my childhood, from age 
birth, age nine, I probably threw away a million dollars worth of baseball cards. We used to use them as clackers in our bike, bicycle spoke. So you would ride your bike and you get that noise because you wanted to sound like something that had an engine. And I probably destroyed Mickey Mantles and, oh, yes, yes. And not realizing 50 years later that a Mickey Mantle rookie card was worth millions. And we clacked them away in our bicycles, folks. Oh, heavens, yeah. yeah. If only you knew. Only, well, there's that, there's that magical statement. If, like dinky toys, we, we played with dinky toys in those days because they were the best toy you could buy. And when you got a dinky toy, it was like getting treasure because they were so well made. But they, because they were so well made, they were expensive. And we found out years and years and years later that those dinky toys were worth humongous amounts of money in the box. If you had the original box and the... Yeah, just used to, I used to watch the uh, road show and a fellow would bring in a dinky toy and they, they'd be all because <laughs> it had its original box that was perfectly in perfectly pristine shape and oh at auction that'd get five thousand dollars and I played with them and blew well, them up. Who, who keeps it in the box? Why well, some people do. Oh. Some people do. It's a toy. You're supposed to play well, with it. Well, no, not, not everybody looks at it that way. I know. Not everybody looks at I it that know. way. We used to blow them up. <laughs> oh, we had great fun. We, had, we used to blow up airplanes and everything. We had, my cousin was a, <coughs> he was kind of a, he lived down, down on, um, by the ranch. We grew up with him. Uh, got in all kinds of, he liked to blow things up. He was, uh, he was a chemical. As a child, he, chemistry sets, and making things. So he'd, he'd make his own gunpowder and, oh, we just, we did some pretty crazy things. We won't go into that. I'll just say we'll leave it at that. We did some pretty crazy Don't things. Wanna...